Hello, and welcome to another installment of Andy's Philosophy Corner on the Steel Plaza podcast. I am your Chief Philosophical Officer, Andy. This time, we will be discussing the apparent takeover of new media as a substitute for big traditional media. And as always, I am wearing the traditional Greek toga as as the podcast is being recorded, just to get in the spirit of things. Special guest joining me this time to discuss new media taking over is Ray Ann. Hello, Ray Ann. Hi, it's good to be here with you, Andy. Yes, uh, thank you. It's so great to have you, and you've uh, been a listener of the podcast for some time now, and it's it's really a pleasure when um, there is more interaction with uh, some of the listeners because it's meant to be a discussion, not a dissertation. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad to be here. Fantastic. You have Odyssey. You have BitChute. You have many, many, many new platforms out there, listeners, where you can get news and information and entertainment. That's really the subject for the podcast this time around. I think one of the best ways to begin the discussion is to start from my own perspective and Ray Ann from yours. What information gathering was like when we were much younger? I am uh, many years older than you are. However, I can share what my experience was and and then I'd uh, be... uh, interested in hearing about yours. But when I was a child, there was TV. It was color TV. There were three VHF stations, and depending on the weather and other conditions, you could get one, maybe two, maybe even three other stations. There was no such thing as video recording. This was pre-VCR, pre-DVD. When it came to newspapers, you had usually several local papers and uh, large papers from other cities from where you could get your information. And there really wasn't much else uh, outside of periodicals such as magazines. And so things were very, very limited just back when I grew up in the 70s and in the 80s. Rayanne, how would you uh, describe or characterize information that was available to you when, when you were younger? We had probably four channels. The main basis of everything was four channels. And maybe we got maybe two or three extra. And that was all we had to watch. Besides the periodicals, as you said, like the newspapers, the magazines. And my mother was a, she was an avid buyer of magazines. My dad was an avid buyer of papers. So that's basically all we had. Now I grew up having VHS when I was about 10. So Mm. that, and to record on those was an absolute nightmare. You know, that was interesting at that point when it started. When it was brand new, it was, it was very challenging. But that's, that was how we shared what we liked and our information that we had on those tapes. We shared it with each other, but we had to use two VCRs, record it from Mm -hmm. one to the other, and then we can give it to our friends so they can watch what we thought was great. Right. That was that was exciting when the new technology came yes. out. I actually recorded that program, or uh, as we got a little bit better with uh, changing the time on our VCRs to stop flashing 12 o'clock, <laughs> once we <laughs> mastered that, it was very exciting. Uh, similar, uh, maybe in some ways, to recording music from the radio, which many of us made mixtapes just listening to the radio, hitting the record button when uh, uh, our new favorite song came up. Regarding information, we, of course, also had libraries, and you could access different reference books and dictionaries and encyclopedias and newspapers from other cities or past uh, issues of newspapers stored on microfiche, but 
compared to what we have today, looking back, it seems like the Stone Age almost. It was so minimalized. It, I didn't realize how limited my information was until I grew up and saw this huge explosion of information that I could actually seek out and read, right? you know, and watch, which was completely different than how I grew up. Yes. And that's, I think, part of the great aspect of the internet and the information age is the mind-blowing amount of information that is being sent around. It's it's a new age for, for humankind, just as the industrial age was a revolution, and the information age is now a new type of revolution, and we're, many of us are still uh, stuck on 20th century sources of information, as I would like to put it. And so I think we're all seeking to find our footing in this information age, and this podcast, New Media, taking over, I think is very true in a lot of sense when you look at the ratings for networks and the circulations of uh, newspapers. I think a lot of news, quote-unquote, news organizations are fighting for relevance. I have a friend who's a uh, contributor, has been for years, with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. What they found is People don't need them as much as they used to. I hate to put it that way, but technology has displaced most industries, including information, um, forced players to make changes. So versus the sources that you you watch when, when you were younger, um, have uh, uh, how has that changed over time? Has Are there particular... Sources or individuals, uh, newscasters specifically, that you find are, are just as credible, have any fallen from grace in your eyes? Because they're fighting for your competition. They want your attention. As a person that's listened to the same newscasters, I mean, obviously they've changed over time, but it seems like the message has been pretty much the same in terms of what I began watching as a child to... Now, I haven't seen much of a difference there, but the difference I have seen, there seems to be some things that newscasters say that I don't know if they're coming from that particular person or not. I quest, I start, que I, I've been questioning more whether that's because I want to understand, I want to know more, I don't understand their meaning behind it. But I want to divulge deeper into what I'm hearing. So the things that I took as truth as a young child is not what I'm seeing now. I look at what they say and I question it. And I want to find every resource possible to develop my own sense of what I think is truth. You know, what I think is believable mm -hmm to me in what that develops my own truth. So that's the change that I seem to have made throughout this information change, the age of information kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely questioning an, an official story, I think, is important if you consider uh, in the 2000s, the Kevin Costner movie about JFK. There was an official story, and he said... I got questions. <laughs> something as simple as that. And something I mentioned just a few minutes ago uh, before we started the podcast was just this morning, I was watching some old George Carlin stand-up routines and something, the uh, reactor, because that's a big deal, YouTube reaction videos. He for one thing, pointed out that George Carlin isn't being a comedian as much as he's bringing up uncomfortable truths. Um, one of the main subjects was, or, or left me with the impression, why are so many more people just trusting of everything the government tells them now? It didn't used to be that way. 
people used to be allowed to question. In fact, the media used to be in charge of questioning the government. They have a special purpose and privilege in, in the United States. So George Carlin invariably would get a lot of reaction from his audiences. You know, are we really supposed to trust the same people who had one story for JFK's assassination? But lots of people have lots of questions. And I think you made the comment, too. Why aren't we so cynical anymore? Why aren't we cynical anymore? Yes. Yes. Uh, pointing out contradictions in our, 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 our lines of thought was something George Carlin mentioned. Specifically, one thing was how people will say and, and agree, we need more prisons, we need more prisons, which is debatable. But his point there was something called, it's an, an acronym called NIMBY, not in my backyard. Oh. You know, uh, we need more drug rehabilitation centers. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But not in my backyard. But just to be cynical of our government, and he mentions, uh, he starts off by saying, isn't it time we start bombing some third world country again? Because it seems I, he's, I like to think he's not more cynical than I am, but I think, I think you can't be, I think you can be very, very cynical and not disparage everything, because George Carlin did get very, very dark toward the end of his life, uh, you know, saying he was just eager to watch the world burn and people suffer and die. He he, he really got That's that. very dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, lighten up, fella. His, uh, George Carlin worked in the Air Force, if I'm not mistaken. He was part of the uh, ground crew or in the uh, flight tower for keeping the B-52s. Uh, up and running and uh, the uh, taking off and landing on time sort of thing. So from this, I, I'd like to bring up um, a couple uh, ideas and books that I had referenced previously on the show and we had touched on very briefly earlier. One was futurist George Gilder, who is still alive and kicking as far as I know. Uh, very quickly, if, if you've heard me talk about this before, uh, I apologize, but I think it's it, it's important. In 1980, George Gilder wrote a book called Life After Television. Now, many would say he wrote this book at the peak of television. So it's a very attention-getting title, and so I'm sure many didn't take him seriously at the time. But in that book, Life After Television, in which he essentially foresaw the internet and the information age. George Gilder predicted the smartphones that we carry with us today. This was over 40 years ago. He said, you will have a device you carry with you. It'll be your phone. It'll be how you get your mail. It's where you keep your pictures. It's where you'll manage your money. It's going to be your wallet. It's going to be your timepiece. And he was absolutely right 40 years ago. So, Fast forward uh, to 19, or excuse me, to uh, 2019, I think, was the uh, just two years ago, he came out with the book Life After Google, which again, seems unimaginable. We can't have life after Google. Uh, I think uh, most of us have a, 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 a some sort of Google account. It's, it's very hard to avoid. And if you don't have a Google account, you almost certainly are a user in some Google-owned property. And they have become this sort of monolith. And what George Gilder talks about very, very much in his book is uh, the technology called blockchain, which is really built with security at the heart of it. Uh, to be honest, the computers and code we use now was never really built with your security in mind. They'll let you know they hey, we did some stuff on this end, but you're kind of on your own. The other book I wanted to mention, the third book, was from a different author, and forgive me for not having the name there. Uh, the book is called The Naked Corporation, which, again, is sort of uh, eye-catching. The subtitle of the book is How the Age of Transparency Will Revolutionize Business, and the book is all about 